Hello y'all and welcome to today's video. I'm pretty excited. I'm going to introduce you to a really rad rider today. His name is Charlie and on Instagram he goes by the traveling chopper. Can y'all, doesn't really, there we go. There we go. Of course my phone time's out. Isn't that always how it works? There we go. Scare. Maybe you can see his page. He's got a pretty cool social media page. I've been following him for a while and today he has actually stopped here at the K River Campground and I'm gonna bring you over, introduce you to him, hear some of his amazing travel stories. I'm talking about over 230,000, that's thousand miles on a rigid chopper. <laughs> this guy's pretty rad, he's the real deal and I'm excited to share him with you, so let's go. Stayed in my treehouse over the river last night, so we're gonna go catch him this morning. Maybe uh, bring him up to the clubhouse, get him a cup of coffee. So it is January here, uh, Moyers, Oklahoma. You know, January, February are our coldest two months of the year. He rolled in yesterday. The temperatures, you know, it's uh, 8.30 in the morning and the temperature is 41 degrees outside so you know we still get in the 50s even our coldest months it's still decent for camping but it's certainly our slowest time of year up here even though to me it's some of the best time to be camping but nonetheless that did not stop this man here he rode out here even in the cold er weather and is headed to south through texas well i'll let him tell you the trip let's 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 get over to him so there's his bike the chopper i was talking to you about look at the rake on that thing that is a wild, wild ride to be doing the kind of touring that he's doing. And he's staying up there in our treehouse over the river. Hey, good morning. What's going on, homie? How are you? Good, how are you doing? Good, good to see you. Got you on camera here. Say hello to every World Wide Web hello, out there. everybody. So uh, I was showing them your Instagram page. Do you want to tell them the actual name of your page? Yeah, it's a traveling chopper. And uh, you've been on the road for uh, about a many, month. About a month this time, but you've yep. traveled everywhere. Yeah, correct. Yep. For how many years you've been doing this kind of riding? Uh, about fifteen. So how was your stay last night? Oh man, this yeah, this in is the awesome. treehouse. Did it work yeah. for you? Okay. Yeah, super cozy, awesome, warm. Good man, you got the cure. Did you have a little coffee on I the back deck this morning? Yeah. All right, man. Yeah, it's good. Fantastic. Good. So really, what I want to do is take everybody through your bike. Okay. Um, kind of what you've got, what kind of build you've got, because I just think it's a super rad, unique build. Sure. Um, I just think it's too exciting and fun. And then uh, I want to talk about the type of traveling you've done, because it's super impressive. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. That sounds good. All right, man. We got your bike here. And like I said, uh, walking in before I introduced you to everybody, it's just such a rad build. Tell me a little bit about the front end. Let's start with that, because that seems to be the most unique. Yeah, it's kind of the standout part of the bike. Sure. So what it is, it's a, it's a mild steel, rigid front end uh, tubing. Um, so there's absolutely no suspension? No suspension, no slugs in it anywhere. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an experiment. I, I've been trying for quite a while actually to figure out how to do this and working with a buddy of mine back home, his name is Thomas. And um, trying, to, trying to work with those guys over in Sweden because uh, those guys do quite a bit of this. Okay. And uh, with the translation barrier, it was really, really hard to figure out <laughs> what they were talking about exactly. So we just said, screw it, let's just try a mild steel, heavy wall tubing. Um, he showed up with his five foot length of tube. Originally, he had come over because we were going to kind of set it up and figure out what length we wanted and how much of the tubing we were going to cut off. Well, after sitting in our garage for about an hour, we finally said, screw it, let's not cut anything off, let's just run the full five feet. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And it looks um, good like that. Worked out good. We didn't really know how well it was going to work, uh, how much flex there was going to be in it, how long it would last, if it lasts at all. And it's held up great. How many miles do you have on that front end? Probably about 150,000. Whew! Yeah. It's holding up just fine, I'd say. There. Yeah, yeah, it's been good. And another thing I think a lot of people will want to know, at least I wanted to know, why the dirt bike tire on yeah. the front of the thing? Yeah, so the knobby tires kind of came about after just a bunch of experimentation. For whatever reason, I don't know why, but the knobby tires tend to run 
uh, considerably smoother than a road tire. These long front ends, one of the big issues that they have is that they have a lot of hop in them. They tend to kind of pogo down the road, which can be annoying. In theory, it can be pretty, you know, pretty dangerous as well. Sure. So, I don't know why, but the knobby tire really kind of smooths that out and takes out a lot of that hop. Very cool. So I just kind of stuck with it. And you said you also like to do a lot of dirt roads and stuff, and it helps with that as well. I do like dirt roads. Yeah. Of course, the more traction you have on the dirt, the better. So if people follow you, they're going to see you going across dirt roads, pavement roads, all kinds of roads on this thing. 100%, yep. That's too cool. <laughs> and what about the rake on this thing? Uh, so I've got 53 degrees in the neck and another 7 in the triple trees, so wow. 60 total. 60 degrees of rake. Yeah, no up, no out in the neck. We basically just cut the neck, pulled it out, welded it back together. Sure. That was it. What are some of the other modifications you've done to the bike? Hardtail section, obviously. Uh, this was a soft tail originally. So basically, at the time we did the neck at the same time. So basically cut the frame into three pieces, cut and uh, break the neck, cut the back section off. My, again, my buddy Thomas, because he's an amazing fabricator, uh, custom built that front end, or uh, sorry, the tr uh, rear triangle. Nice. Uh, for the hardtail. Um, other than that, as far as uh, frame modifications go, that's pretty much it. And the engine is just a twin cam? It's a twin cam. It was the 88B okay. motor originally. It is now a 95 inch, well, or not 96, I guess. Sure. Um, still a B motor, but not actually counterbalanced. We pulled those out. Roger. You know, one thing I love about this bike, and we'll go inside the clubhouse here and get a cup of coffee in a yeah. minute, and you'll, yeah, see, yeah. you'll see mine, is it doesn't look like you do too much washing on it. No. More riding than washing. No, I, I had this theory that the grease and the dirt is about the only thing holding this bike, to, <laughs> holding this bike together still. <laughs> I had the same theory and uh, philosophy when it came to my warhorse. People used to give me shit for it on the internet all the time. Yeah. How come you don't wash your bike? And I used to always kind of put a twist to it. And I said, if you got time to clean, got you got time, time to, to lean. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, at the work, they say you got time to lean, you got time to clean. Right. I reverse it up. Let's yeah. get on the road. Let's put this thing in some corners. So you got, uh, what do you got for a headlight on that thing? That's a Vision X LED. Absolutely filthy right now. It's so bad, it's probably one of the, I don't even know if it'll shine <laughs> down the road, but uh, yeah, Vision X, uh, one of those off-road sort of Jeep lights, really, is what it intended to be an auxiliary light. Sure. Um, but this bike destroys lights. And I finally went down to the local Jeep dealer back home in Boulder and said, I want the most uh, durable, brightest light you've got. And that's what we ended up with. And sure. it's, been, it's been amazing. You got open primary? Open primary, yep. And what about parts? What about repairs while you're traveling? That many miles, imagine you're going through a lot of repairs, a lot of parts. A lot of parts, which is a, a big majority of what's in these bags, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Complete charging system, coil, ignition module, spare belts, fluids, kind of the whole thing. Sure, because I mean, a rigid front, rigid back, I mean, you're gonna beat it up and it's gonna have some failures. Yeah, exactly. I and mean, I've got neck, uh, neck bearings, all kinds of stuff. Everything Too you cool. Need. And you said this is originally a 2003 anniversary edition soft tail? It was, yeah. Which uh, I know at, at the time that I started you know, cutting this thing apart, a lot of people were pretty appalled that I would do that to a 100th anniversary motorcycle, but but it's you. Know, that's what we do. Yeah, man. It's, you. it's yours. Choppers, <laughs> this is. And uh, you got the custom grip here on the yeah, left side. Yeah, well, what, did you play off. hockey at some point? No, or? a buddy of mine plays hockey. He came over one day and got so sick and be complaining about my grip falling off all the time. <laughs> he set you up with a hockey he stick He set me grip. up with a hockey stick grip. That's too cool. It's been, on there, it's been on there for years. That's wild. Yeah, it won't come off. No. Too good, man. Wow, what a cool bike. Tell me about some of these stickers. Yeah, so these stickers are the stickers I've kind of collected along the way, places I've been. Um, these countries, Coco's Corner, of course, down to Baja. You've been to Baja, maybe you popped in there. Yeah. Um, these countries over here as well, 18 in total. You've ridden this thing in 18 countries? Yeah, 18 countries. And, and how do you get it there? Uh, on a boat. You just ship it? Ship it over. Is there a company you use, or where does a person go to even begin to find? Uh, Schumacher is, is a good company. I'm going to be using them here in a couple months when I ship it back over again. Okay. Um, this time will be air freight. Okay. Instead of uh, on a boat. I think boats right now is incredibly unreliable. And so where is it going to next? Spain. Spain. And what will it cost you to ship a bike like this to Spain? Uh, about 2500 That's not bad. Yeah, on an airplane. So. Not bad. Yeah, you got stickers from everywhere. 
And you got my favorite one on there too. What? America. And uh, speaking of America, your wife, yep. she's a veteran. Correct. Yeah, she's uh, currently serving her second tour overseas, Kuwait, for the next year. Oof. Which is kind of part of the inspiration for this trip was, well, she's not home. I might as well hit the road. And she rides as well. Correct. Yeah. yeah and what does she got ride bike. Now? She's got a Honda Africa Twin and a uh, little hardtail chopper built by Josh Allison. Too uh, cool. Very, very cool bike. All right. So can you can you rattle off your list of countries uh, by 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 memory or? No, I'd have to reference the stickers. Oh man. All <laughs> yeah. right. Give me give me your best memory attempt at it right now. What countries? Austria. Uh, Austria, hands down. Austria's your favorite. Yeah. Amazing roads, perfect corners, amazing mountains, smooth. Oh, just amazing. Food is good. People are nice. Can't beat it. All right, give me give me your top three. Give me three more. Uh, Germany, Black Forest is pretty incredible. Um, Norway, amazing. Actually hoping to, hoping to be back there in a few months. Portugal was kind of the big surprise. Wow. Yeah, I didn't really anticipate Portugal being as nice as it is. As far as as far as riding goes, very cool. Well, let's go up to the clubhouse, get a yeah. cup of coffee, and uh, we'll talk just a little bit more. Okay, cool. sounds good. Yeah, so that's my old war horse. That's that's what I did my trip on. Not quite the chopper you had, but uh, wow, it's still a cool bike. Though. Electric glide. I did the same thing. Stickered it up with all my stops. Of course, they're all from America, yep. <laughs> not uh, all over the world. But quite the trip. But same thing here. I just didn't wash it much. I left it dirty. It, you know, just rode it. Right. And uh, people gave me hell for that. <laughs> well. The internet, the beauty of the internet, yeah, my friend. Yeah, there's always a critic somewhere. Let's grab a cup of coffee. So around here, the uh, the cup selection is kind of fun. People have sent me coffee cups from all over the country, from all their different clubs or different groups or different towns. What yeah, you got? I've seen that. Uh, you got Ozark, the, uh, Ozark High School. The Ozark High School. Yeah, look at that logo. It's uh, <laughs> the hillbilly. What are they, I think they call themselves the hillbillies or something. Yeah, I think that would qualify as a hillbilly. <laughs> All right, man, so you got your coffee. I want to have a little discussion with you. A lot of my audience likes to know, um, you know, about uh, riding and, and get inspired by the type of riding you do. I mean, heck, even I'm inspired and I, I want to know some things. So um, I'm just going to ask you some questions and we're just going to have a conversation with, with the audience. You can look at me, you can look at the camera. Okay. It doesn't really matter. They're all, they're all going to listen either way. So cool. um, let's start with... Uh, Let's start with inspiration. I mean, you're taking a lot of road trips. I mean, to rack up over 200, and I don't want to sell you short, to rack up over 230,000 miles on a chopper touring the world, that's a lot of road trips. That's a lot of road time. What do you say to somebody who maybe has some road trip experience but is wanting to get into some bigger style trips? Like, what, what, where's your head at when it comes to this stuff? You know, I, I, I write about this a lot in my articles in Cycle Source. Most of those articles are kind of dual purpose. One, they're they're sharing my story of where I've been, what I'm doing, what I'm planning on doing. But they're also hopefully providing some inspiration and maybe some insight on how to do this. Because mm -hmm. that's a, a question I get asked a lot is, is I don't even know where to start. Where do I go? How do I do this? And what I always tell people is start small. You know, just because I'm out there doing a month long trip or a year long trip or whatever it is, doesn't mean you have to jump in with that. You can start with a two-day weekend ride. Mm -hmm. you head out from your house on a Saturday morning, you find a campground two, three hundred miles away, go set up camp for the night, hang out with your friends, or do it solo. And turn around, get up the next morning, and head home. And that's kind of just enough, I think, to kind of kind of get the taste of it a, a little bit. Yeah, I feel like at the end of the day, once you've packed your bike for even two, three days, nothing really changes in your packing or even the mentality of traveling when you spread that out from two to three days to two to three months. You know, don't feel like you need to spend every day on the motorcycle because you don't. You know, if you find a cool campground or a cool city you want to hang out in for a couple days, you know, park that bike for a couple days. Do some, do some walking tours. Hang around, lounge, whatever Absolutely. it is. All right, man, another question for my audience and, and frankly for myself too. If you were going to send somebody who is an experienced road tripper, mm -hmm. okay, I've done a lot of miles in America, they've, they've traveled around, they've gone out for weeks on end, they understand living on a bike, they understand traveling on a bike. If they wanted to get into international travel, three part question. One, uh, where would you send them first? What's the first country you'd send them to? Second part of that question, what are some of the challenges you sh they should expect in doing such? And the third part of the questions, where you're sending them, what are the top things they should do? Okay. 
Uh, my, my first thought would be send him to a major city uh, like Barcelona. Um, now part of this is going to hinge a little bit on how you ship your motorcycle. If you ship it by sea, you're, you're going to be a little bit restricted. You're prob probably going to end up in Antwerp, Belgium. That's a major shipping port there. So what's going to happen is that you're going you're gonna to ship your bike, it's going to end up on a boat, it's going to end up in Antwerp, Belgium. At which point, point then you would hop on a plane, fly over. Not really a lot of hurdles to get over there. You know, you, you'd get over there, you're obviously gonna wanna have your international insurance lined up. The bike will go through customs automatically. How long um, does that take? I would plan on about a week and a half. Okay, and so do you send your bike in advance, let it go through all that, and then fly in, or do you fly in and wait for your bike? I would probably do it in advance. Okay. Uh, and if you time it right, you should be, you know, you should be able to arrive within a day or two, but uh, but coming through customs, because it's going to sit in a warehouse for a week or so, you know, by the time they process it all. Sure. Try to find a hotel that's kind of near. If you can figure out what uh, what warehouse it's going to be at, try to find a hotel close by because you're not gonna have motor transportation, so whatever you're doing is gonna be via taxi. Um, show up with a gas can, because you're gonna have to drain your fluids before it goes on the, before it goes on the boat, um, which can be kind of a pain in the neck a little bit. So um, you need gas and oil, or just gas? Just gas. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I've never had to drain oil before, just okay. fuel. Otherwise, it's pretty much just make sure you've got your you know, passport, uh, international insurance, international health insurance, which, which are all easy things to do it can sound a little intimidating mm -hmm. i think but there's plenty of companies out there that that handle tourists you know doing stuff just like this so cool um which you know the other nice part about a big city especially like antwerp um most everyone speaks english so the language barrier isn't really a big issue may run into it a little bit in the small towns which is where i would recommend going anyway pointing and gesturing gets you a long ways <laughs> so yeah. you can pretty much always figure it out for sure, you know, or, or or you know that person's gonna know just enough English to kind of get by, or or maybe you know a little bit of German or Spanish, and you can kind of you, you know just kind of get through it. Because you know those are things that people typically ask me. It's like, well, how do you combat language barrier? Fortunately, knowing English doesn't tend to be a big issue. Street signs is an, another big thing people ask. Well, how do you know? where to go, you know, what roads to stay on, what are stop signs look like, you know, very mm -hmm. basic questions that yep. are valid questions. Again, they're all pretty obvious. Very, very unlikely you're going to royally mess it up. Common it sense goes a long ways. You know, if you're talking behind a car, if you have questions, just you know, stay with the car. The, the car's not going to mess it up. Right. Yeah, local's not going to mess it up. Um, other than that, I mean, it's really just like riding here in the States. I think I would have all the s same recommendations. Stay off the major highways. Stick to the small two-lane roads, the small villages. They're way more entertaining. You're gonna see a lot more. The food is way better. Hotels are cheaper. Campgrounds are easy to find. In fact, campgrounds are kind of everywhere out there. So really, I, I you know I kind of feel like my my rec recommendations for traveling in the U.S. Most of those apply to Europe. The only hurdles you have to get over is obviously the cost of getting a motorcycle there and then some of that paperwork, but that's all very easy, and there's plenty of people that'll hold your hand and walk, you, and walk you through it. Rock and roll, man, thank you. Yeah. Man, well, thanks for sharing the, uh, the international knowledge with me and all my, all my friends here online. Finish telling me, if people get on your Instagram, follow you on Instagram, where are they gonna see you go on this trip? So, from Oklahoma, uh, what they'll see is me leaving here momentarily and uh, heading down to Marfa, Texas. Uh, for Marfa, I'll start heading west, most likely end up on the west coast, basically make a U-turn, head back to the east coast. From the east coast, I'll be shipping the bike to Europe, as we just talked about, at which point I'll go to, or near Lisbon, Portugal, which is the westernmost point of Europe. And then I'll spend two, two and a half months kind of doing laps around Europe, probably get up into uh, Scotland, Ireland, Sweden, Norway. But then towards the end of May, I'm going to start working my way over towards the Russian border. I haven't completely determined where I'm going to cross into Russia. It would be one of three places, either Finland, Estonia, or Georgia. Uh, and obviously those are on opposite ends of the map. Uh, Finland and Estonia being very far north. Georgia being on the south side of Russia, which will take me down through Turkey, 
and then looping back north into Russia. A lot of that is gonna be kind of playing it by ear, figuring out as I go, kind of depending on uh, political climate primarily, <laughs> especially right now with everything that's happening over there. And then once I get into Russia, uh, I'll be crossing the entire country to the east coast of Russia, coordinating shipping out of either Vladivostok or taking a ferry from Vladivostok to either Japan or South Korea and then shipping back to the west coast of the United States and then finishing the ride back to Colorado. So by the time it's all said and done, it should make for a complete lap around the globe. Two. Cool, man. So there's one thing I know about traveling on your motorcycle, and um, I'm going to kind of break my own rule here. Sure. Uh, I know that every piece of paper takes up space. Correct. And you never have room for any gifts. Right. But I'm going to give you something, and if you want to give it away in Dallas or whatever you want to do is fine. Okay. But I just recently made my very first chopper shirt. Cool. And I can't think of a more fitting person to gift one to. Awesome. So I'm going to give it to you. Thank you. And I, and I just think it fits you. What size are you? Medium. Medium it is. So this is uh, my dirty side down chopper shirt. Oh, it just man. remembers to keep the dirty side down. Yeah, look at that. It's a little vintage 70s style. Awesome. And uh, very like I cool. said, I know that it's very difficult to uh, add anything to your pack. But it's okay. If it makes it through today, at least that'll be great. Awesome. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank Rock you. Rock and roll. While he packs up and heads out of the campground today, I just want to remind you all, today is a different kind of video. If you enjoyed it or have any critiques, please leave them down in the comments below and uh, I'll be sure to read them. And I just wanted to share such a rad dude on such a rad journey with y'all. If you're new to my channel, please take the time to go down and smash that subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we put up new videos with new trips, journeys, and interesting characters. Like my friend right here, Traveling Chopper on Instagram.